I'm, I'm not sure how to tell you this, but there's something about me that you really need to know. Something that some of you might have not realised. <laughs> Frankly, it's been eating me up for a really long time. So it, it's time to come out. I'm a nerd. Yeah, that's right, dear viewer. I'm a nerd. I can lap without even thinking about it. I've been known to throw my fair share of D20s with gay abandon, sometimes with a disadvantage. I've cosplayed, I've fursuited, and yes, I've even LARPed a little bit. I'll joke riff with friends on topics as diverse as sci-fi and fantasy through to quantum physics and music theory for hours. And frankly, I think watching two grown adults joust on horseback at the local Ren Fair is a far superior way to spend a summer afternoon than watching a monster truck do tricks or attend a local sports ball event. And unless it's cricket, because as you all know, cricket is a thinking person's game. As part of my secret superpower, I'm also quite the computer enthusiast. I even wrote this script on my Apple PowerBook 150 from 1993 running System 7.6. What? I'm also someone who enjoys tinkering with home automation, the occasional command line, and plenty of Linuxy goodness. I've actually used sudo make me a sandwich in anger and homebrew is set up on all of my machines i also even know my way out of vi the answer in case you're looking is colon q enter but seriously friends don't let friends use vi i know i know that's fighting talk as kate Walton elliot told me when she was reading this script but seriously you're either with vi or you're stuck in an eternal loop trying to figure out how to get out of it. As a home automation enthusiast, I like to bring in data from all kinds of different smart devices in my home, as well as data from other sources like my EV telematics, as do many, many other home automation enthusiasts. These integrations allow us to better interact with data from all of the things we own or use daily. They allow us to track usage, save energy and create cool automations that make our lives a little more pleasant. But some automakers don't want you to do that. They want you to use their own applications to interact with data from your car. And for the first time a month or so ago, Mazda threatened an owner with court action for developing a third party alternative to its sanctioned app. And if one company has done it, we should expect others to follow. This one is going to get kind of spicy. Today, we're going to be discussing some fairly common computing terms that I'm sure some of you already know, but for those who don't, let's have a little refresher. And yes, I'm going to keep these explanations fairly generic and high level, so please don't get angry if I don't drill down enough. The first thing we're going to touch on is the term API, or Application Programming Interface. APIs consist of a series of documented commands that can be used to communicate between different applications, allowing one device to share data with and interact with another. Those commands are usually specific to the service or device the API has been written for, but they usually follow standard programming conventions and syntax to facilitate their use and often use a standardized communication protocol like HTTP, as is used for a lot of the web, REST or some other well-known communication. APIs can be either completely private, meaning that only the company that designed it and its official partners can access and use it, or it can be restricted, meaning that you have to become a vetted third-party developer. Sometimes you'll just have to pay to access it, and sometimes you just have to agree to various software terms before you can officially start to develop it. Or they can be completely public, meaning that someone somewhere has made all of the details of the API readily available for others to use. In the case of automotive telematics applications in general, the car talks to the automaker's server using a private API that only the automaker, 
and very select third parties can access. Your smartphone app then talks to the same server using a different API, allowing it to securely pull down data from the server for your phone. When you want your EV to heat the cabin on a cold winter day and you hit the button on your smartphone app, the command is sent securely to the automaker's server using one API, and then the server then sends the command to the car using a different API. Unless your car has a Bluetooth phone as key, in which case I believe the command can be sent directly, but Bluetooth doesn't have a great range, so it's normally sent over the interwebs. But because automakers are often either wary of or want too much money for access to their APIs, often what happens instead is that people reverse engineer things. If an automaker doesn't make its API available, then what some people do is document the API that the official application uses by reverse engineering it. They'll use software tools like a proxy server or a network monitor to figure out what commands the app, being a smartphone or an app running within a web browser, sends when it calls home. They will then document the responses from the server at the other end. At this point, I feel I need to reiterate that people reverse engineering these protocols is usually enthusiastic owners who have logins for their system. They are often software engineers in their day job, or at least very enthusiastic amateurs with decent code knowledge. They're not just breaking security protocols, they're just using legitimate login details to access the API using something other than the official sanctioned automaker app. Also, it's important to understand that reverse engineering has been part of software and hardware development since long before Kate Walton Elliott's dad was designing mini computers. For the most part, when someone figures out the protocols used to communicate with an API, the company in question tends to turn a blind eye and ignore it. Essentially, as long as the people reverse engineering it aren't making the portal less secure or are doing something to burden the servers, and I'll come back to that in a second, all is pretty good. Because, to be honest, the people doing this tend to be the kind of people who'll help companies improve their own products. But not all automakers feel that way, which is where we are with the story of one CX60 driver who was sent a Digital Millennium Copyright Act takedown notice, or DMCA, by Mazda. Why? He'd reverse engineered the API used by Mazda's smartphone app and web portal to talk to Mazda's servers. But the majority of people who were using this were putting it to good use, setting up things like time of use charging for their plug-in hybrid or EV based on home energy generation or grid emissions and cost. Some people were using it to see if they'd forgotten to lock their door. You know, nefarious things that would lead to the downfall of society. You wouldn't download a door lock. For those who don't know, and I think it's probably worth mentioning at this point since DMCA is fast approaching its 30th birthday, the DMCA is probably one of the most abused pieces of legislation passed in living memory. It was essentially designed to protect the rights of copyright holders, everyone from businesses to artists, from online copyright infringement. But it's been used extensively in its near 30-year history to fine people huge sums of money for downloading music. Fines, by the way, that are well in excess of anything someone would face for crimes like tax fraud or murder. Preventing farmers from being able to work on their own tractors. And much, much worse. Interestingly, when companies do send false DMCA notices, there's essentially no repercussions. Not that we'd know anything about that happening to us, of course. Brandon Rothweiler, a home assistant enthusiast and coder, had developed his own add-on for home assistant in order to allow data from his master to be used in his own home automation system. But master claims that his code, quote, violates master's copyright ownership, end quote, and quote, uses certain master information, including proprietary API information, end quote, to create code. It also argued that his open source freely available Home Assistant integration contained code that, quote, provides functionality identical to apps that Mazda has published to the Android App Store and Apple App Store. Hmm. See, 
I have a problem with this because I looked at Mazda's official apps and unless I am very much mistaken, they don't do half of the things that you can do with a home assistant integration and some basic script logic. With the latter, you could tell your vehicle to precondition just before you leave for an appointment. You can tell your car to lock its doors if you've forgotten to after a set period of time and so much more. With the former? I don't think you can. The problem behind all of this is that while Mazda bought its big guns to the table and basically scared Rothweiler and other coders on the project into removing their code, advocates and legal experts suggest it was punching well above its weight category. The add-on written by Rothweiler made use of Python and JavaScript, neither of which contain any proprietary information from Mazda. What's more, while the Supreme Court of the United States hasn't yet officially issued any blanket rulings on use of APIs being fair use or not, many experts believe that reverse engineering an API for interoperability is indeed considered a fair use exception to DMCA. And that was backed up in 2021 when a court case that the Supreme Court did rule on, Oracle v. Google, determined that in certain cases, re-implementation of an API, particularly for the purposes of connecting and extending products, is fair use, at least in that particular case. For master owners, though, that project is gone, and that will be noticed by others in the auto industry, companies that are looking to make extra money from customers as a part of the transition to EVs. We've already seen GM, for example, pledge to move away from including Android Auto and Apple CarPlay connectivity in new models, choosing instead to use its own in-vehicle infotainment system that it has complete and total control of. This is, by the way, despite numerous surveys, the most recent of them being 9 to 5 Mac last week, detailing that more than 70% of people won't consider buying a car if it doesn't have Apple CarPlay connectivity. Other automakers, BMW is one of the most notable, have toyed with making some previously standard features like heated seats a pay-for subscription service in many markets. Kate Walton Elliott has grumbled frequently among the team about having to pay the highest subscription for her Nero EV in order to get preheating. And Hyundai Kia, along with Genesis, has made absolutely no bones about its collective plans to turn drivers into the product that they then sell to advertisers, so that your driving habits and personal preferences can then be used to advertise things more directly to you. A recent report from the Mozilla Foundation detailed just how automakers collect vast scads of data to flog off to the highest bidder. And it sadly goes far, far deeper with the, to quote Cory Doctorow, and shittification of the internet, making things that were once free and easily accessible now paid for features. Just last month, Chamberlain, the company that makes a huge number of garage door openers currently installed in North America announced it was pulling all third-party support from its platform and instead insists that owners use its standalone smartphone app. An app which, by the way, floods your eyeballs with adverts for new products when you sign into it. Which is, by the way, why I think Mazda did what it did with its smartphone app and anyone daring to reproduce it with an open source project. Mazda's app can be used to sell you a brand new car, probably a non-EV. A third party app? Well, it wouldn't do any of that nonsense now, would it? Luckily for Home Assistant fans, there is a solution to the garage door problem. Search up R-A-T-G-D-O if you're someone who has a Chamberlain or Liftmaster garage door and likes home automation. I placed my order for one last week. But for automotive telematics fans, there are, unfortunately, fewer solutions. Luckily, Tesla and Volkswagen both appear to be quite happy about people using home assistants to use their respective APIs to build fully immersive and connected experiences for their customers. But as I said earlier, anyone using third-party APIs should be cognizant that if you spam the servers constantly for status updates, you will be banned. Several folks have claimed that neither GM nor Ford are allowing third-party access or doing so will cause you to be banned from their servers. But based on what I've been reading, if you treat the API with respect and you don't spam it every few minutes, you're fine. Additionally, if you'd like to not pay connected car fees for your automaker, which can be anything from free for the first years to 
20 or $50 a month or more, and you want to know categorically that you're not going to get into trouble for using a third party integration, maybe you should consider the Open Vehicle Monitoring System. It's a really awesome piece of hardware and software and has frankly become a whole lot more capable in recent years with lots of compatibility for EVs. Since it interacts with cars using the onboard diagnostics port, it is very difficult for an automaker to stop it from being used. Granted, functionality does vary greatly between vehicles. Kate comments that the Kia Nero EV support is not great. Essentially, once you've bought the hardware, bought your own SIM card and you have your own data plan, then you're away. You even don't have to use the open vehicle server to connect to if you don't want to. You could just use your own. I'll link to it below. And if you'd like to see us do an up to date review of the system, let us know. So while you can leverage APIs for your own benefit and convenience and open source projects are free to use, you should consider supporting the people taking the time and energy to develop them. Use any third party integrations responsibly and keep your eyes peeled for our own tutorial on home assistance and EVs very soon on this channel. Oh, and if you can, consider supporting the EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation. They are fighting all of this DMCA nonsense in a very proactive and very important way. There are links below. Master's success in scaring someone away from doing their own work is one part of a troubling trend, and I suspect it won't be the last of it if other automakers believe they can get away with it and they think they can charge you more for getting the same functionality somewhere down the line. So it's important to let automakers know that this isn't OK, and at the same time to push for legislation that protects individuals' right to use, modify and adapt the equipment they own, whether it's a garage door opener, an energy monitor or a car, because, and sing along if you know the words, if a company controls it, you don't own it. Thanks for joining me today. And if you've got thoughts, make sure you leave them below in our Discord chat room, or you can reach out to us on Mastodon. Thanks to the amazing lists of people scrolling by on your screen right now. They are some of the more than 1,500 people who help fund this channel through Patreon and YouTube. They cover our bills, pay our team, and make sure that we as a channel can remain 100% independent. If you'd like to join them and see your name listed here, just go ahead and follow the links below. There's a range of different tiers you can sign up for from as little as $1 a month, or if you pay every year, just under $11. A huge welcome to our newest supporters. They are Patreon user 1124, Gordon Smith, Alan Williams, Tim Nicholas, Jalia Hallett, and Nathan Plowman. If you'd like to support us with a one-off donation, you'll find links below to make Kofi and Bitcoin donations. And we even have a good old fashioned PO box you can reach us at. The address is linked to below. And if you're in need of some swag, you'll find our swag store in the down below as well. We've got some great content coming up, so make sure you're subscribed on Peertube or YouTube. Again, links below, and we hope to see you again soon. We make new videos every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. If you want more, the mighty algorithm thinks you will enjoy this video, but we here at the channel also think that this one is well worth a look. Thanks for watching, see you soon, and as always, keep evolving!